Hello, my name is Michael Kelly. I'm a clinical professor at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy and currently serve as the Associate Dean for Professional Education. Prior to this, I was a clinical pharmacist with specialty in family medicine and psychiatry. My research and practice interests continue to be in the management of psychiatric and substance abuse problems in the elderly. In this part of the training program, we will talk about when it is appropriate to use antipsychotics for the behavioral problems of dementia, the choice of an antipsychotic, and the potential adverse effects of these medications. We have used Mrs. Klein to illustrate points throughout our presentation series. To summarize, she was admitted to a nursing facility when her husband was no longer capable of caring for her. Behaviors that have been addressed since her admission include wandering, elopement attempts, nighttime wakefulness, daytime napping, distractibility at mealtimes, resistance to personal cares, and language deficits that have interfered with communicating with her wants and needs. Her stay was also complicated by an episode of delirium that may have been the result of a drug toxicity, infection, or dehydration. The delirium was addressed and managed using a combination of medication and non-drug interventions. Antipsychotic use has not been necessary to date. Most recently, Mrs. Klein has exhibited behaviors that have placed her and a fellow resident at some risk of harm. She has always had some difficulty eating, but recently she has become convinced that someone is trying to poison her and she is refusing food. She has also developed a delusional belief that one of the female residents is spending time with her husband and that is why he only comes to visit in the evening. She has become so convinced of this that she has been verbally aggressive with the other resident. Please consider whether or not it would be appropriate to start Mrs. Klein on an antipsychotic as we discuss the use of antipsychotics in patients with dementia. As Mrs. Klein has illustrated, there are many approaches to managing the behavioral problems associated with dementia before the use of antipsychotic medications are indicated. Antipsychotics should only be used after these other approaches fail. In fact, antipsychotics are not FDA approved for the management of these problem behaviors. They are not even indicated for the psychosis that may occur with dementia, although their off-label use for this is common. Given this prescribing gray zone for the use of antipsychotics for these indications, it is very important that prescribers speak with patients and their families to discuss the risk that accompany their use. As we consider the use of antipsychotics in our patients with dementia, it is important to remember to complete a thorough assessment focused at identifying any causes that might be managed without the use of medications. Non-drug approaches should be tried first and should be continued even if an antipsychotic medication is started. We also need to recognize that these behaviors are often self-limited and that continuing assessment and reevaluation is necessary to properly use these medications. The Dementia Antipsychotic Prescribing Guide outlines the appropriate approach to deciding whether antipsychotics might be used to address challenging behaviors. It highlights the appropriate treatment targets among many inappropriate uses. Even though antipsychotics are not officially approved for the management of dementia, they are widely used and their appropriate treatment targets are recognized. The psychotic features that can accompany dementia, hallucinations or delusions like those that seem to be troubling Mrs. Klein may respond and their use seems intuitive. The presence of these symptoms alone should not be sufficient for the use of antipsychotics. They need to be troublesome for the patient. Other treatment targets are recognized. Aggressive behavior that may pose a danger to the patient or others may also justify their use. Other treatment targets are less well-defined and the use of antipsychotics is directed at relieving distress of the patient or reducing threats to others. They should be used only when the patient is experiencing inconsolable or persistent distress, has experienced a significant decline in their ability to function, or if their behavior creates a substantial barrier to their receiving appropriate care. These are rather high standards that act to protect the patient from ineffective or unnecessary use of antipsychotics. There is no evidence that antipsychotic medications are useful for any of these behaviors. Their use is inappropriate. As you review the list, you can see that some of these are quite common and can complicate the care of the patient, but they do not respond to antipsychotics, which should not be used. 
If any of these behaviors pose a problem, they should be addressed with non-drug means where appropriate, monitored closely, and documented accurately. Prior to initiation of an antipsychotic, it is necessary to clearly document treatment targets. Justifying the initiation and continued use of these drugs will require this evidence. Make it clear just how often and when the behaviors are occurring, their severity, and any triggers that may be observed. Do be specific and descriptive. Continue to gather this information after a therapy has been started. This documentation will allow you to evaluate the response to the drug and make informed decisions about the appropriateness of its continued use. As we think about the care of Mrs. Klein, the use of an antipsychotic medication would seem to be appropriate. She is having delusions that are jeopardizing her care and are causing considerable distress. She is reluctant to eat at all of her meals and this has resulted in a five pound weight loss over the past two weeks. There have been verbal outbursts directed at another resident several days in the past week, usually occurring in the evening. There are no clear environmental triggers. Non-drug approaches have been used to address the behaviors with limited success, but it will be important to continue them as we initiate an antipsychotic. We need to follow a systematic approach in our choice of an appropriate agent. The first question is, does the patient have Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, or frontotemporal dementia? If you are not sure, refer to the diagnostic criteria for each condition. Therapeutic approaches to these conditions are presented on the next slide. The use of antipsychotics to manage the behavioral problems of dementia in a patient that also has Parkinson's disease is complicated because the drugs are poorly tolerated. The dopamine blockade that is characteristic of these agents may worsen the symptoms of Parkinson's. Chances of therapeutic success would be increased by the use of an antipsychotic with less potent dopamine receptor blockade. If Lewy body dementia is present, antipsychotics are relatively contraindicated because they can precipitate neuroleptic malignant syndrome, a potentially fatal complex of symptoms that includes fever, altered consciousness, and autonomic instability. Cholinesterase inhibitors may be of use. Frontotemporal dementia impacts the part of the brain responsible for executive function. It is characterized by disinhibition and carbohydrate craving. There are no known therapeutic treatments. So, is there a best choice for an antipsychotic in patients with behavioral problems and dementia? Therapeutic trials of these five antipsychotics have demonstrated modest improvement in symptoms of patients with dementia. Haloperidol has been available the longest and is described as a typical antipsychotic with its effect primarily due to potent blockade of the dopamine receptor. The other agents are referred to as atypical antipsychotics because their effects at neuroreceptors differ. Evidence does not exist to support the use of other antipsychotic agents beyond these five. Haloperidol and risperidone are available as generic products and may provide more cost-effective treatment. Use of antipsychotics in placebo-controlled trials for the treatment of behavioral disturbances of dementia have shown only modest efficacy. Risperidone has demonstrated some efficacy in individuals with psychosis. In those patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms, defined as the presence of psychosis, agitation, or aggression, risperidone was again shown to be more effective than placebo. Aripiprazole also demonstrated modest efficacy in these patients. Both agents were more likely to be effective in those patients that did not have psychosis, in nursing home residents and in those with severe cognitive impairment. Haloperidol has shown efficacy similar to the atypical antipsychotics and has the advantage of considerable experience with its use in these patients. The KDAD trial made an important contribution to our understanding of the use of antipsychotics in dementia. The trial compared olanzapine, quetiapine, or risperidone to placebo in patients with behavioral disturbances. The primary outcome was time to discontinuation of the drug for any cause. For this outcome, there was no difference from placebo for any of the medications. A secondary outcome, change in the clinical global impression, was also similar for all three medications and placebo. Subanalysis of the time to discontinuation due to lack of efficacy did favor olanzapine and risperidone over placebo. The mean time to discontinuation for risperidone was 26.7 weeks, olanzapine 22.1 weeks, quetiapine 9.1 weeks, and placebo 9 weeks. Dropouts due to adverse effects favored placebo. 
5% of placebo patients discontinued due to intolerability compared to 16% for cotiapine, 18% for risperidone, and 24% for olanzapine. This table summarizes the evidence on efficacy of atypical antipsychotics. It's from a review commissioned by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. You can see that the authors determined that risperidone has the best evidence for efficacy across all categories of symptoms. Aripiprazole and olanzapine have the next strongest evidence, depending on whether the target symptom is psychosis or a behavior related to agitation. Quetiapine has the least evidence supporting efficacy, with most of the studies in dementia showing no benefit. Haloperidol was not reviewed, but a Cochrane systematic review concluded that the evidence showed a reduction in aggressive behavior with haloperidol treatment. Given their modest therapeutic effect, it is important to minimize the chances for adverse effects when selecting an antipsychotic. Therapeutic and adverse effect profiles of the drug are determined by their relative activity at receptor sites. This table demonstrates activity of the antipsychotics at particular neuroreceptors. The ability of a compound to interact with and block the receptor is represented by the plus signs. The more plus signs, the more potent the drug is at that receptor. As an example, haloperidol, listed in the upper left corner of the table, is a powerful dopamine blocker and has three pluses. The strength of binding at the receptor defines a drug's therapeutic use and its adverse effect profile. In the case of haloperidol, it is a potent antipsychotic that can cause extrapyramidal adverse effects. Atypical antipsychotics, which include all the agents listed on the table with the exception of haloperidol, were designated as such based on their lack of propensity to cause extrapyramidal symptoms and tardive dyskinesia. This actually has more to do with their effects at the serotonin receptor. Note their activities at the 5-HT2A receptor and compare them to haloperidol. As we go further down the chart, you can see the other receptors that these agents may affect and how that relates to their side effect profile. Olanzapine binds tightly to the 5-HT2C receptor and can cause weight gain. Sedation and hypotension, more commonly associated with risperidone and quetiapine, are the result of activity at the A1 receptor and so on. Knowledge of the probability of particular adverse effects based on receptor activity can inform our product selection particularly in patients with comorbidities. In patients with diabetes or hyperlipidemia, olanzapine should be avoided because of its negative effects on weight and serum lipids. Haloperidol use would be problematic in patients with Parkinson's disease. Regardless of the medication chosen or the comorbidities present, it is critical to start these medications at a low dose. The elderly patient is particularly susceptible to the adverse effects of these medications. This table, from the Dementia Antipsychotic Prescribing Guide, summarizes what we know about the adverse effects caused by the antipsychotics that may be useful for the management of behavioral disturbances in dementia. It more or less reflects the information from the previous table with severity of adverse effects closely related to the strength of interaction at the receptor. The more boxes that are present, the more likely the agent is to cause that particular adverse effect. Haloperidol is a potent dopamine blocker that is the most likely to cause extrapyramidal movement disorders. Olanzapine has the strongest affinity for the histamine receptors, and we see considerable weight gain and sedation with that agent. Using this information, we can look at our patient's needs and comorbidities and make an informed decision on which drug might serve them best. I would like to point out that the chart also contains the recommended dosages. When considering the use of an antipsychotic in a patient with dementia, it is important to take into account some of their serious adverse effects. Many of the adverse effects of antipsychotics are common and have been recognized for many years. Some of the less common but more severe effects have come to light more recently. One of these is the risk of cerebrovascular events, including stroke, in elderly patients with dementia. First associated with risperidone, an FDA warning was ordered for this drug based on results from three published double-blind placebo-controlled trials. A subsequent analysis of these trials, combined with three unpublished trials, found a statistically significant increased risk of these events that is reflected in the table. Other investigations have found increases in cerebrovascular events, including death from stroke, for other atypical antipsychotics, and they all carry the warning in their prescribing information. A meta-analysis with the atypical drugs 
found an event rate of 1.9% for the group and 0.9% for placebo. Just how the drugs increase the risk of stroke is unknown. Further investigation has shown that the risk of cerebrovascular events is the same for typicals and atypicals. Do bear in mind that none of this evidence is based on trials designed to specifically address the risk of cerebrovascular events in elderly patients with dementia. A serious mortality risk must also be considered before starting an antipsychotic in an individual with dementia. A black box warning to prescribers detailing this risk was initially issued in 2004 for the atypical antipsychotics, but the typical antipsychotics were included later and may carry even greater risk. The warning was based on a review of all published and unpublished proprietary studies. It includes the reminder that these drugs are not approved for the treatment of patients with dementia-related psychosis. The cause of death seems to be primarily cardiac problems and infectious disease. When compared to placebo, the likelihood of death in individuals receiving antipsychotics is increased 1.6 to 1.7 times with an attributable risk of 1.2%. Using these figures, the number needed to harm is 83. A meta-analysis of large-scale randomized trials of atypical antipsychotics found the number needed to treat to obtain a benefit ranged from 5 to 14, depending on the outcome selected and the criterion for improvement. Combining these results, you can estimate that for every 9 to 25 persons that are helped, there will be one death associated with their use. Let's return to Mrs. Klein. Because of ongoing issues surrounding her care that include the presence of psychotic symptoms and the potential danger that her behavior represents to herself and others, a decision has been made to start an antipsychotic medication. The family has been consulted. They have been adequately informed about the obvious risks involved and they agree to a treatment plan that now includes an antipsychotic. Now we need to select an agent. From what we know of Mrs. Klein, which of the five agents would you select? Apart from an episode of presumed delirium that may have been caused by the anticholinergic activity of one of her medications, she is in basically good physical health. This makes the antipsychotic selection process a little less complicated but think about the level of effectiveness and the side effect profile as you make your decision. Haloperidol has many years of clinical experience and is available in an inexpensive generic. There is a risk of Parkinsonian symptoms, but it does not cause a lot of sedation, has little effect on weight, and does not cause confusion, edema, or an increase in triglycerides. Therefore, the decision is made to use haloperidol. What about one of the atypical antipsychotics? Risperidone is also available generically, has evidence for effectiveness, and has been used successfully in clinical trials and practice. Aripiprazole might also be a good choice because of its generally favorable side effect profile. Either of these drugs might have been used. Haloperidol was chosen because of the provider's preference. Quetiapine did not demonstrate equivalent efficacy in the Katie trial. It also carries a risk of sedation and negative effects on triglycerides. A recent FDA warning unique to quetiapine warns of drug interactions causing prolongation of the QT interval. Olanzapine has a greater side effect burden and can cause serious weight gain and increases in triglycerides. Good practice suggests that we start at the lowest possible dose. For haloperidol, the table tells us that is 0.25 milligrams daily. Mrs. Klein will receive the medication in the evening. It is important to remember that the antipsychotic may take several days to a week or more to demonstrate an effect. Raising the dose without a fair therapeutic trial can increase the likelihood of adverse effects without an improvement in behavior. We've provided a section on dosing for each of the antipsychotics that might be appropriate for behavioral challenges in dementia. The fundamental rule in using any of these is go slow. We have tried to emphasize that non-drug management should always be attempted before any use of antipsychotics. It's equally important to continue non-drug strategies when an antipsychotic is prescribed and continue to monitor and document the target behaviors so that you know if the drug is helping. But with the addition of an antipsychotic, you need to put a plan in place to watch for adverse side effects. In the next part of this program, we will discuss this important activity and we will see whether our decision to use haloperidol has helped Mrs. Klein.